So the title of the presentation is after Indentia, British Liner Companies and Racial Management in the Early 20th Century. And I hope uh, it will become clear why I've chosen this title in the course of this lecture. So what are we going to discuss today? So first I'm, I'm going to introduce my premises. The premise that we are dealing here with a multi-layered and combined regime of labor regulation. And I'll explain what I mean by that. I'll then briefly talk about status in contract. That is the legacy of the master and servant law as we encounter it in maritime labor relationships and particularly in the labor relationships of Indian seafarers. The next section is entitled status reinvented. So this is about new status category, particularly the ones that are constituted by immigration law and how they combine with labor law and other forms of labor regulation since the late 19th century. We then turn to racial management in the British Empire a bit away initially from seafarers because we need a wider context. Look then at combined and racialized regime of labor regulation, more specifically in the case of Laskers, and end by discussing racial management and the labor process on British steamship liners. So you see, it's quite a long program. So if you have enough, just tell me. So then we cut it short and just begin with the discussion. So the premises. There is a paradox which I'd like to take as a starting point, the paradox of maritime labor. So this is a workforce that is particularly mobile. The social spatial mobility of seafarers is more extensive than that of other occupational group. And there is a strong tradition also of labor militancy among them. But this goes along historically with an excessively authoritarian labor regime, which we encounter both on sailing ships and also later in other forms of shipping. And what uh, uh, Marcus Redeker has called a totalitarian work environment. So you have extremely mobile workers who are, however, at the same time constrained to a very narrow space, that is the space of the ship and under control while they are on board ship. So the question is how we, how we deal with this paradox. What is the narrative that we, that we choose? So many historians of maritime work would today try to distance themselves from what they call victimology. So that basically we look only at structures of control and there's a trend to what I would call agenciology. So that is basically just to discuss the agency uh, of maritime, wor maritime workers. And they had no doubt uh, a lot of agency. So there is a tradition which I've mentioned already of protest and of militancy. In historiography, my sense is that the emphasis on agency, mutiny and maritime uh, radicalism is overdrawn at times at present. So there's the image of the indomitable motley crew, the crew that consists of people from all over the world. And this is irrepressible in its mobility, but also in its forms of protest. And I discern a note of idealization in it and also a, a, a flattening of historical dist distinctions, which I'm going to talk about. Sometimes I get a sense that anti-globalization narratives blend into narratives of globalization. So that there is a sense where libertarianism, the celebration of, uh, of subaltern resistance basically meets liberalism in that both imply a denial of the structure basically of authority, a disengagement with these structures of authority. So this is something I'd like to look at from a rather different angle. And I begin with my premises for an examination of maritime labor regimes in the late 19th and early 20th century. So the first premise, I have given the number zero because I shouldn't have to make it at all actually because it's a mere banality. This is that the, to understand possibilities and limitations of counterpower from below, it's necessary to analyze the strengths and weaknesses of power from above in labor relations. That's my starting point. So actually, I'm more interested in the possibilities of counterpower from below 
But as a former trade unionist and labor activist myself, I know that this is fairly impossible if you do not know what you're against of. The first premise is a real one. To understand labor relations, it's insufficient to examine the primary form of establishing them only. Since the decline of slavery, to this primary form is typically contract. But this is not sufficient because as a rule, contract does not replace status, differential social status, but is propped up by various older or newer forms of status differentials by differentials of gender, of age, of race, of caste, or also of citizenship. So for instance, in uh, early textile industries in many parts of the world, you find that a large majority of the employees are girls. So to discipline an, a new industrial workforce, it has been found useful by entrepreneurs in Britain, in Japan, in India, in many parts of the world, to employ a workforce that, uh, that has particular disadvantages through its social status and combine the work contract with this status distinction in a particular way. And this is just one of multiple examples. So we get a multi-layered and combined regime of labor regulation. The contractual part of it is only one, but an important part of it. The second premise is this, maritime labor regimes cannot be examined in isolation. So admittedly, the work environment of the ship, extraordinarily mobile and confined at, find at the same time, I've mentioned that just now, renders them specific and in many ways unlike any other. At the same time, labor relations on board ship are embedded in the context of the overall development of labor regimes in the late 19th and 20th centuries. The third premise is the following. An understanding of the structures of power and counterpower in the world of labor requires an understanding not only of the mechanisms of establishing labor relations. This is what many labor, uh, labor historians often focus on on the contracts that, be, that are being signed, that are being concluded between entrepreneurs and workers on the conditions of these contracts, for instance. But we also need to look at the structure of social relations in the respective labor processes. This is what historians usually are very weak in. So they do not look at the work processes itself um, by the way, Michael, I very much liked your description of the labor process in, in sugar harvesting in Cuban plantations. That is a notable exception. The fourth premise is this. In the maritime world of labor, labor processes have been transformed fundamentally, and so have been labor regimes. In the literature, there's an assumption that maritime labor is maritime labor. Seamen are seamen. But that's not the case. There's more than one maritime labor regime and each of them needs to be examined in its own right. Work on a sail, sailing vessel is very unlike, work on a steamship is very unlike, again, work on a motorized container ship of today. These are three uh, entirely distinct labor regimes that need to be studied in their own right. So now to the first substantial section of the paper, status in contract, the legacy of the master and servant law. British maritime labor law provided the basis for the legal regulation for the employment relationships of colonial seafarers, including the so-called Laskas, the Indian seafarers I'm mainly talking about. And British maritime labor law was in turn based on and akin to a, a type a genus of British labor law that emerged after the Black Death of the 14th century was consolidated then in the 16th century and further developed in the um, uh, subsequent uh, period and comprised a plethora of laws and ordinances. It was known under the generic designation of master and servant law. So this is not a single law, but a type of law. Master and servant law was applied to a very wide variety of occupations, from domestic servants, um, agrarian workers, artisans, industrial workers, 
seafarers, of course, also, and it was uh, uh, and it was applied across the British Empire in all, in all parts of the British Empire. And there are also cases when it actually transcended the boundaries of the empire and impacted on labor regulation of non-British territories. It was formally abolished in Britain in 1875 but continued to shape employment relationships in some occupations, particularly in seafaring, even also in Britain. In British colonies, laws and ordinances of this type to continued not only to be implemented, used, but also they were also newly introduced even after World War I. So the duration of that type of labor regulation, the durability of that type of labor regulation uh, is, is particularly strong. It's half a millennium. There has been a major comparative research initiative, which was led by Douglas Hay and Paul Craven. Uh, the main publication not comprising all of that research is Master Servants and Magistrates in Britain and the Empire, 1562 to 1955. It was published in 2004. I believe it is one of the most important publications in labor history in the, in the last decades. Um, but I'm not sure whether this is so much common uh, knowledge, but some of you may actually be familiar with this work. So what is this about? So I hope I'm not boring you. Some of you might be aware of it, but I, but I still need to sum this up. So all of us have uh, a level playing field. Laws and ordinances in the framework of the master and servant law combined three distinctive features. First, the labor relations they regulated were based on contract. Okay? So these are contractual labor relations we are talking about. That's important as the starting point. Secondly, they were enforced, the performance of these employment contracts was enforced by way of largely undocumented summary justice. So not informal court proceedings, but by summary justice, and the summary justice could be conducted by um, um, by uh, justices of the peace in uh, English counties, but it could also be conducted by plantation managers in Assam. So it was pretty informal. The third feature, however, is crucial. That's what it is all about. Breach of contract by the servant was defined as a criminal offense. Okay, punishable by imprisonment, corporal punishment, and fines, as well, of course, the feature of all wages for services already performed. In contrast, breach of contract by the master was treated, treated as a civil matter, entailing at most the payment of damages to the employee. Okay, so this looks like a technicality, but it is not. This is, I would say, one of the most resourceful and flexible inventions of the legal mind to preserve substantial unfreedom and differential social status in a world of labor increasingly shaped by contractual wage labor relations. Okay, and I'll explain why. But I'll explain only after mentioning that um, this is not just about British master and servant law, but this is about a type of legislation that has parallels in various parts of the world. The one in Britain and in the British Empire is only best explored, best examined by, by Hay and, and Craven. But in the German context, for instance, you do have very interestingly the Gesinderecht, which comes up after the so-called liberation of peasants in the early 19th century to reduce the mobility of the, of the rural population and regulated farm artisan and domestic wage labor from this period onwards until the no November revolution when it was abolished. The criminalization of breach of contract only on the part of the employee that is common to Gesinderecht and to master and servant law achieved the squaring of the circle. If contract logically required the formal equality of the contractual parties before the law, 
Master in Servant Law and Gesinderecht and similar forms, legal forms, succeeded in reconciling the ascription of unequal legal status to master and servant with the legal form of the labor contract. In other words, we do not find a teleological movement from status to contract as the one that was pronounced by Henry Main famously, but we find an integration of status in contract. Status moves into contract, is preserved in contract. So I've tried to, formul to formulate the main findings of Hayes um, and, and Craven's work. These are not my findings, it's just my formulation of their findings, uh, but I can't do better than I did at that time. So I'm quoting myself, I apologize for that. Thus master and servant law constructed employment relationships as contractual relationships between formerly unequal parties parties who were bound by the contract in divergent ways. Medieval concepts of the asymmetrical legal status of master and servant were preserved by giving them new expression in the language of contract law. It was precisely in its capacity to provide concrete bridges over the abstract gap between formal freedom and servitude that is in the construction and legitimation of an uninterrupted continuum of legally regulated employment relations between slavery and free wage labor, that the incredible practicality and adaptability and the remarkable longevity of master and servant law lay. As mentioned before, master and servant law was not a single act, but a pattern observable in a wide range of legal devices for the regulation of labor relations. Indenture contracts were one such legal form and one of those used most widely in the British Empire and for a long period. When indenture contracts that, res uh, that restricted exit rights of employees for several years were finally outlawed in the early 1920s, unequal status in contractual labor relations continue to be preserved in the realm of seafaring. Shipmaster, the shipmaster was at the same time the employer's agent and judicial authority. Master and commander, basically, how it is called in, uh, in English. Criminalization of breach of contract can be found in these labor relations uh, as well. Um, breach of contract would be called mutiny or desertion. So defined as crimes. Heavily punishable crimes at that. And there was a, always a restriction on exit rights. In practice, however, the translation of unequal legal status into actual subordination became more difficult in regard to British seafarers in the late 19th century. So there was a, a greater claim to political participation in Britain at that time. There was the rise of the labor movement. There was a new unionism that, uh, that included particularly also seafarers who were well organized. So the laws continued to exist but it became more difficult to actually implement them. Enter the Indian seafarer Alaska. The utilization of status in contract continued to be more feasible, more feasible than in regard to British uh, uh, ship workers with more disenfranchised colonial maritime workers. They were less unionized at that time, less politically enfranchised and less politically represented. There was a massive growth of proportions of employment of these uh, colonial seafarers in the age of steam shipping. 50,000 or a quarter of the British maritime workforce was from India in the interwar period. And even if you look at the global workforce, I would say this is about 10%. So a one out of 10 seafarers was from India at that time. In the 19th century, a bifurcation of the British maritime employment contract in Siemens articles and Laska articles occurred. Okay? So articles are the contract. 
This is the maritime labor contract. But you had two types, one for European seafarers, or let us say non-Indian seafarers, more precisely, and one specific contract for uh, seafarers who were on under the government of the government of India, the British colonial government of India. And the latter contracts were called Asiatic Articles or alternatively Laska Articles. The differences between these two types of contracts were in part only gradual. One should not basically exaggerate this. So one basically should not create a new binary between free European seafarers and unfree colonial seafarers. It's not working like this. But the distinctions were nevertheless substantial. Breach of contract defined as mutiny or desertion was still there for all seafarers. That did not disappear, even for British seafarers. But the exit rights of Laskers were more narrowly restricted. The, their contract could only end in India itself. So if you went out on a voyage from India to Britain and the ship reached a port or in the US or any other country, you could not leave the ship. You could not terminate your contract. You had to remain with that employer until you returned to India. That was a major difference to all other seafarers. You were bound for a longer period. The ship owner also possessed the, the right to transfer you to another ship. So if he didn't have any use for you any longer, once you had reached London, you could be transferred to a ship in Glasgow to, present, to be sent onwards over the Atlantic to New York without having a decision base, the right to disagree or to terminate your contract. And it was also possible for various reasons, partly also legal reasons, to restrict shore leave. So you may not have been able to even leave the ship once you have reached a port, which was also a major difference to European sailors. The work, work time on board ship was legally unregula unregulated. So there was no basically legal restriction of work time on ships. And that was true for white ship workers as much as for colonial ship workers. But there was a customary established um, time regime that was valid for white crews that was accepted also to some extent, or, or, although there were always conflicts about it, of course. Yeah, but there was, for instance, the idea that stokers had the customary right to be employed two for our watches in a day, not longer. Indian seafarers, however, were employed on so-called khalasi watches, which basically meant that they were permanently on call. So. Here, even a customary entitlement to restricted work time was not accepted. The customary rule, it was stated, was to be on call permanently. So we have just seen that older distinctions of unequal status between master and servant came to be backed up by other status distinctions, by distinctions of race, and by, and by colonial subjecthood, which I've just basically mentioned in the case of the Luskers. This is observable, of course, in many occupations. You can see that in domestic service, where master and servant hierarchies were further enhanced by status differences of gender and age, for instance. So that is not only to be found in this particular case, it's a more general pattern. Can we then argue that Henry Maine was wrong in assuming a replacement of ancient status by modern contract and that ancient, ancient status survived in a modernized adaptation as a subordinated element to contract? So this is partly so, but it's not the whole story. Because hierarchical status difference cannot be entirely reduced to social distinctions of ancient origin. You know, distinctions between genders. Distinctions in terms of ethnicity. Distinctions in terms of, of age. There's one type of hierarchical status distinction that emerged that became possible 
only in the late 19th century. And this is exclusive citizenship backed up by restrictive immigration policies, backed up by pervasive passport and visa regimes and the identification and the identification techniques that were necessary to actually implement this by modern states. Only in this historical context, the inferior status group of the immigrant could possibly emerge. And that also plays a role in our context. While passports and visa regulations restricted the freedom of contract of all seafarers, if you are interested in a, in a very graphic description for the case of white seafarers, have a look at B. Traven's The Death Ship, the German version written in 1926 and the English version in 1934, which, is, which brings this out very clearly. Racist anti-Asian immigration laws and, current, uh, and quarantine rules uh, existed, for instance, in Australia, Canada, and, and the US, and helped to confine Asian ship workers to steam vessels even more rigorously when they were in port. They were simply not allowed to leave the ship. Hence, we find multiple and combined layers of regulation through contract and status. We find status in contract of the master and servant variety, we find uh, layers of regulation through racial status, through colonial subjecthood, through citizenship, plus also, and we'll come to that a bit later, plus status categories that mattered in the regions of origin. Now, racial management. Is racist status difference employable for the subjection and regulation of labor other than slave labor? Much of the historiography seems to suggest otherwise, much of the labor historiography. Racism in the world of wage labor appears to be mainly relevant in the context of labor market competition. The racism of the white worker, so this is what is mainly what we are hearing about, the white worker as the favorite whipping boy of the liberal middle classes. And the white worker is presented as the real issue, not as an, not an inherent racism in employment relationships. Exclusionary racism, that is a racism that wanted to exclude ethnic minorities from, labor from the labor market or particular labor market segments, was no doubt widespread among white British seafarers. And before the interwar years, it was also rarely openly contested. That changed to some extent in the 1920s and 1930s with the rise of a minority movement in the British trade union movement. Yet another articulation of racism has been all but ignored that prevailed in government and business circles, a managerial racism that did, that did not seek to ex exclude the lower races. So this was not exclusionary, but it, uh, but it uh, tried to utilize presumably divergent physical and intellectual capacities of human races and combine them most effectively for the benefit of the employer. Such forms of racial management have been studied by David Rödiger and Elizabeth Esch for the US American post-slavery society, especially in an important article published in 2009, which I mentioned here, and David Rödiger developed this further in a later book. One particularly influential propagator of such ideas who succeeded in building a career on his racial management expertise was the mining engineer and future US president Herbert Hoover, who summed up his calculations in 1909 as follows. Much observation and experience in working Asiatics and Negroes, as well as Americans and Australians in mines, leads the writer to the conclusion that averaging actual results, one white man equals from two to three of the colored races, even in the simplest form of mine work, such as shoveling or tramming. In the most highly skilled branches, such as mechanics, the average ratio is as one to seven, or in extreme cases, even 11. So Joe Biden's statement that uh, uh, Donald Trump was the most racist president in US history is at least debatable. So what is the argument here? If a Chinese worker 
as Hoover believed, required only a sixth or even a twelfth of the pay of a white worker, you could calculate, you know, when it would make sense to employ a Chinese worker or a white American worker. It was just a question of optimizing the racial composition of a workforce, and that was a matter of balancing wage costs and racial productivity rates. Obscurantist racial algebra of a very similar kind could also be found in the British Empire, however. In India, anthropological taxonomies of castes and tribes had been generated since the late 19th century. There had been hierarchical tables of martial races eligible for army service, of coolie races to be favored in plantation recruitment, or of criminal tribes to be subjected to strict work regimes if possible in guarded camps. Typologies existed also of seafaring races distinguished, uh, distinguished according to presumptions of an inherited affinity to seafaring or of a superior physiological capacity to bear the extreme heat of the so-called or of a special propensity to serve others as stewards. British ships officers debated the relative advantages of employing deckhands from the Konkani coast in Western India, the Maldives or the Chittagong district in the Bay of Bengal, comparing them at the same time with specific ethnic groups from Patagonia or elsewhere. Irrational racist essentialism was expressed in the language of mathematical exactitude. A manual for British ship engineers thus claimed that a European fireman could work between uh, 0 0.71 and 0 0.729 tons of coal per hour, while natives, Indian ship workers, would move between 0 0.378 and 0 0.417 tons. That is a 1923 publication. Actually, it's a publication that appears every few years, but 1923 is the edition where I've taken this out from. Crew sizes were determined in accordance with such calculations, Indian steamship crews often being about 50% larger than white crews. Despite the language of racist unreason, racial management was so pervasive because, I would argue, it served, it actually served employers well in very tangible ways. And I'm coming back to that towards the end of this talk, if you bear with me that long. Before we turn to the labor process on steamships, we need to characterize briefly the nature of the labor relations of Indian seafarers on British steamers since the mid 19th century, well into the period when coal-fueled steamers were slowly replaced by diesel-fueled motorized ships in the second and third uh, decades of the 20th century. Quarters, actually, not decades. Indian seafarers had been employed on European sailing vessels for centuries, but their numbers rose massively after the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869, when they served on British steamers even beyond the Indian Ocean. The companies that pioneered the employment of Laskers were the Peninsula, Peninsula and Oriental Company. You can still see their com uh, containers on days when the railways function in Germany and the British India Steam Navigation Company, which controlled a lot of the, uh, of, a lot of the steamer business uh, in Indian ports, the majority. These Luskers were employed on the Asiatic Arctic, as we've talked about, their entitlements were considerably and consistently over a period of more than a century lower than those of European seamen. They uh, got about a quarter or a third of the wages. They, uh, they received half of the accommodation space sort of managed, uh, measured in cubic meters or cubic feet rather. They, uh, their, their food was less expensive. They received little or no compensation in case of accident and so on. They were recruited through middlemen, so-called serangs, who also served as boatsmen or foremen on board ship and who were often assisted by a level of junior supervisors called tindals. Above the level of the serangs, Further layers of intermediation could be involved in the recruitment of Lasker seamen, hostel owners, for instance, in the recruitment ports who were called Barivalas in Calcutta. Uh, 
There were village clubs uh, like the Gorn Coors in Bombay. There were also commercial contractors in the business of recruiting seafarers. Recruitment and control rely to a large extent on a combination of local status hierarchies and systematic indebtedness. There was a preference for relatives and village neighbors. There was an importance of religious bonds. So Punjabi Muslims would recruit Punjabi Muslims, go on Christians, only go on Christians. A graded system of bribes called salami, which means complementary fee, which ensured debt bonds between the serang and the crew. Recruitment occurred from all parts of the subcontinent, but there were certain key regions that were important. I'll just give you a very brief and schematic overview. Deck crew, that is the, the seafarers proper, were recruited from coastal areas, mainly from the Konkani coast in the west and from East Bengal, the blue colored regions here. Stokers, those working in the, in the fire room uh, were mainly um, recruited from inland regions with no connection to seafaring actually at all, like Northwest Punjab and uh, East Bengal, here colored in magenta, magenta. Stewards were, uh, were preferably recruited among Christians in certain parts of Goa. There was only a small number of recruitment ports for steamship and in the order of importance and from east to west, these were Calcutta, Bombay and Karachi. Indian seafarers were designated by British officers and seamen as coolies, often also as niggers, indicating not only racist prejudice, but also a particularly subordinated instrumentalized employment status. Ship owners and state officials preferred the term natives, but to praise their greater docility, the term that is generally basically used as compared to the British Jack Tar. This presumably racially inbred docility was the result, however, of a combined regime of labor regulation with the, of the elements of which I have mentioned already and which extended from the local to the international level as follows. The local status designations, family, village, community were reinforced by debt, was reinforced by, uh, by servant status in contract, was reinforced by racial subordination, was reinforced by colonial subjecthood, racialized immigration and racialized immigration status. All these elements combined to secure discipline or subordination. And all, uh, even though this series may sound impressive, it did not preclude, of course, that people resisted, withdrew, jumped ship, and found their own ways. Racialization also reshaped the composition of the steamish crew. The sailing, sailing ship had, been, had indeed been characterized by the proverbial motley crew of multiple ethnic and linguistic origins. You know, the kind of crew that you might encounter if you read Herman Melville's novels, which had to be able to communicate nevertheless to operate the complex early modern machine of the sailing vessel. So you needed a lingua franca among that motley, motley crew to know your ropes, literally. Yeah? To be able to work the rigging of a sailing ship, you needed to understand the commands. You needed to know basically which ropes to pull and how they were called. The technological shift to steam shipping went along with a compartmentalization of skills, chains of command and crew. There was a split between the deck and the engine room crew. And on passenger steamers, there was another split um, to the saloon crew, the stewards. Communication all along a unified chain of command, which had been essential on sailing ships, was less essential for the navigation of a steamer. And it now also became possible to that certain supervisory tasks, for instance, in the fire room, in the stokehold, could be contracted out to intermediaries like the Serans. The compartmentalization of the chain of command permitted an ethnic segmentation of the crew, not motley crew, but segmented crew, which British ship owners preferred and could achieve in times 
or well-supplied maritime labor markets. So the so-called crew could be of one ethnicity and the deck crew of another. And this split was actually preferred. Racial segmentation facilitated the use of intermediaries. The Serang had greater control over family members and village neighbors. And it also created a structure of what I call social bulkheads, you know, like the bulkheads in the ship that prevent the ship from sinking when the hull has been damaged in one place. Um, they would, they would uh, affect uh, social compartmentalization. Fraternization between linguistically separated departments of the ship was much more difficult. Periodic episodes of labor scarcity, particularly the world wars, when it was difficult to get seafarers, to find seafarers, upset the preference for racial segmentation. But ship owners employing Laskas preferred different ethnic and linguistic groups for each of the ship's department. Skilled jobs, the jobs of officers and engineers, but also certain skilled jobs of deck and engine room crew, of ratings, not of officers, remained the preserve of Britishers, except to some extent in, the, in, in Indian Ocean shipping. This too erected social bulkheads by enhancing the hierarchical relationship between officers and crew, as well as within the ratings of each department. As mentioned before, among the employees of the British merchant, and now we are coming to Brit racial management and the labor process on British steamship liners. Finally, among the employees of the British merchant navy, the largest in the world, the proportion of Indian seafarers reached its climax in the interwar period, 50,000 men or about one quarter of all employed people. This was at a time when overall employment declined in British merchant shipping due to the rise of US and Scandinavian competitors and due to a slow transition to less labor intensive diesel technology. You didn't need as much workers on diesel uh, fueled ships. Even though large parts of the fleets were replaced after World War I, the highly centralized British shipping industry was much slower in replacing coal-burning steamers with diesel motorized ships than their competitors for various reasons, which I cannot discuss today. But I'll only discuss one of these reasons, and I argue that this reason was their privileged access to massive reservoirs of colonial labor in India, West Africa, and other colonies. This privilege mattered not only and not even mainly because of uh, the lower wages that could be paid to colonial workers. A more complicated pattern is suggested by the fact that most Indian seafarers were employed not in the technically least advanced and least profitable sector of the shipping business, but in the top segment, the liner traffic that was controlled by five giant shipping concerns. Liners were large ships, mostly ma uh, male and passenger vessels that ran on fixed scheduled as opposed to so-called tramp steamers that picked up a load in one port to deliver it in another to find a new cargo in that port. Okay, so these were the two basic patterns of steam shipping. Tram steamers were owned, often owned by smaller companies, had a longer runtime. They were the ships were used over a longer period, required less investment, therefore, and ran at a slower pace. Liners went for lucrative mail contracts given by governments and military transports, which compelled them to outperform competitors in terms of speed and punctuality. They generally ran at full speed. Port time was often measured in hours rather than days. And they were replaced by the newest generation of larger and faster ships more often. That means that is they were much more capital intensive. The pioneer in employing Luskers in large numbers outside the Indian Ocean was the Peninsula and Oriental Steam Shipping Company, as mentioned before the largest of the five major liner companies. Other companies followed their example from the 1890s onwards. The question then is this, why did some of the most powerful ship owners of the world controlling the capital intensive top segment of the British merchant shipping, 
stick to an increasingly obsolete technology and rely on the cheapest labor force at hand, even though manning rates, remember Lasker crews were often 50% larger, might have suggested lower productivity. It doesn't seem to make sense at first sight. To find the answer, we need to climb down into the dark and stifling hot Stokehold at the bottom of the steamer's steel hull. And I'll try to make this very short by just discussing with you a few pictures to give you a relief after the lot of text I've treated you to. Okay, so this is a photograph of the most famous liner ship still under construction in 1912, most famous, but not, as you know, not very long in service, the Titanic. And you can see this is um, a huge ship a huge steel hull um, with an enormous machinery. Yeah, this is high technology of the age. So this is an industrial product that can only be produced even with the most modern machines of the time and which is premised on the most complex technology that is available at the time. Okay, so now we go down to the Stokehold and what I'm going to show you is a drawing and a woodcut. Both were made by stokers, by people who actually worked in these stoke halls. So on the left, you actually see the tools of a stoker, of a fireman on a steamer. And this drawing is made from someone who worked on German steamers up to the 1940s. And you'll notice that these tools do not look very sophisticated. They look a bit like garden tools. Okay, now if you look at the woodcut produced by a Swedish artist who also worked as a fireman for a very long period, Torsten Billmann, you see a change of watch. And he captures in this woodcut what you cannot find on many of the photographs that uh, exist, um, um, which, which have artificial um, sort of lighting, which stop the work process actually to catch the people who are working there. Here it is all going on. So you see the darkness, you actually see the heat and the whirling, um, the, the, the whirling air, and you see the uh, exhaustion of the shift that has just, of the watch that has just finished uh, their four hours. You can also see that they are carrying buckets because their work is not finished because they have a sort of very heavy task of removing, removing the clinker and the ashes after their shift, yeah, which has to be done. So their tools are next to the ladder that they are climbing upwards where they throw the ashes basically overboard. And there's no possibility really for a chat, you know, at the time when the watches is being changed, there's just the possibility of a short, basically glance over the shoulder of one of the workers of the new watch. So it is intensive work pressure, basically that you are facing there. So the labor regime, which you find down and basically the right on the right in the right corner, just down, you see ashes and clinker, which need to be removed because if these fault-prone fault uh, machines need to be repaired during the journey, so you can't have basically all sorts of wage blocking the way. Okay, and these machines need to run. If it is a liner, they need to run at full speed without interruption. They cannot stop at all because that would, uh, that would um, uh, jeopardize the security of the ship. And they need to run at full speed because that otherwise would jeopardize the profitability of the whole enterprise. So you do have most advanced technology, highly capitalized and very simple labor processes, relying on human labor. Simple does not mean unskilled. Yeah? So you need to know what you're doing and this, is a very, and this is a very tricky kind of work. The labor process in the Stokehold was thus extremely labor intensive, considered unskilled, but at the same time of central importance for the security and for the functioning of the steamer. The Stokehold was also a zone of uncertainty. There were multiple factors that impacted on the actual labor requirements. You did not know how much work you actually needed down there because that depended on so many minor factors. Most importantly, the quality of coal changed everything. Yeah? 
there was the fault proneness of the machinery, yeah, which you needed to know and which varied from ship to ship and you needed to react to and so on. Stoking was physically extremely demanding, hence the two four hour shifts and not one longer shift. And it was rather uncertified than unskilled. This zone of uncertainty could be managed according to different management strategies in at least three different ways. And that's the point I want to come here to. So in many tramp shipping companies worked with systemic undermanning. So they didn't employ enough people actually to work these machines properly. They employed mainly low wage white, uh, low wage white workforce, typically the ill reputed Liverpool Irish. They had an extremely high labor turnover, up to 50% of the crew deserted if they reached a, a port in the US or in Australia where the wages were higher, for instance. They had a high incident of malfunction because they simply didn't have enough people to maintain the machines properly on sea and take care of the repairs. So they had periods of repair in port where they were stuck in these ports for longer periods. And thus they had to cope with delay and longer lay days in port. But it still worked because this was a comparatively a low investment type of shipping. Then you have a second pattern, and that is one that we should expect, actually. So if you have a massively capital intensive enterprise, you should expect that a company invests more in labor so that it wants to regularize a workforce that will be, pay them better, try to reduce labor uh, turnover. And in fact, this is what you can find among a liner companies based in Southampton, as Valerie Burton has uh, worked out. Uh, for instance, the white line yeah, that owned the Titanic. Here you find higher levels of manning. Employed were mainly locally resident and married English men. They were better paid, owned their family wages, were in long periods of employment. There was accordingly a very low labor turnover, a great stability. The ships were kept in a good state of repair uh, high speed and punctuality were achieved. Okay, so this is not surprising. That's the pattern that we should expect. It sounds a bit like Volkswagen. Okay. P&O and other liner companies did something else. Okay, so they worked with so-called excess labor, the larger crews, we're coming back to them, 50% larger. Yeah, they had, in other words, an internal labor reserve. So to work this zone of uncertainty, which I've basically mentioned, so they had more workers basically that could take on work if required, if something actually happened. They included a greater age span within the workforce. So they had people which we would consider children, but they also, had, they also employed older people which would not have been employed in white crews. So they preserved skill longer in these crews this uncertified skill of the so, uh, and they had a longer training period also for uh, the younger seafarers. They had a large proportion of low paid luskers with a stable or lower wage bill. And what they achieved was again, basically like in the second model, low rates of labor turnover, a good state of repair of the ship, high speed and punctuality. Okay. So this was then a way to use the racial composition of the crew for management purposes. It was a real alternative, an economically viable alternative to model two, which is the one we are more familiar with. Okay, to briefly sum up my two main arguments. The first one, I think was pretty straightforward. Indian seafarers were subordinated by way of a multi-layered and combined labor regime based on status and contract that permitted to assign them permanently to a maritime sub-proletariat in terms of wages and all other compensations and working conditions. It also secured a higher level of work discipline and constrained in particular the extraordinary degree of spatial mobility that is potentially a hallmark of maritime employment.
The second argument is this, racial management specifically a regulated racial composition and segmentation of a steamer's workforce provided ship owners despite the sheer irrationality of concomitant racist discourses with viable options for the profitable management of steam vessels, even in the industry's top segment. A combination of low wages, high levels of control, including an additional level of supervision, the serangs and tindals, and the employment of an internal labor reserve were the key components of this management option. So that's it. And I almost kept the time.